Oh. All right. Okay, so today we're going to... Uh, oh, hold on, hold on, go back, go back. Wait, wait. Oh, I, I killed that. I had such a great intro. Oh, there it is again. Okay, here we're going to do. Hold on, go back, go back. Oh. I got to set it up. I got to set it up. I lost my setup. Okay, well, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing I want you to know before uh, we look at Sir Mix a lot again uh, is optimism. Like, you can be really honest with God of what is on fire in your world. And you can bring all those things to Him as we're about to look at. But as a Christian, because there's an X factor that holds everything in the palm of His hand, it doesn't mean it won't go bad. It doesn't mean He won't say no. It doesn't mean he won't say, well, hang on. But it means, quite literally, it's always possible. Always possible. And that's, that's even beyond optimism, and it's what we would call hope. Because hope is then connected to something that transcends the human experience and time and everything else. All right? Now, <laughs> here's what's going to happen in this sermon. 90% of you, or, or most of you, are going to catch 90% of the sermon. 90%. You're gonna, you're gonna, we're going to be good, okay? And a, a smaller percentage of you near my age, okay, 5 to 10 years older and younger, are going to catch 100% of the sermon, okay? So when you see anyone potentially laughing at some point in the sermon, and you're lost about that 10%, just wait till after the service and be like, why were you laughing? Okay? I'm just going to warn you now. Not everyone's going to get it, and it's fine. Okay? Now, this is interesting. Uh, I'm like 12 or 13 years of age, and uh, Christmas comes around, and we had all the cousins buy each other, uh, like, gifts. Okay? All right. All right. Hit it. Here we go. Now, I want you to see. This is the gift I got. Here's the gift. Yeah, there it is. So you, you may know exactly what you're looking at right now, and some of you may not know. Now, I will tell you that my Uncle Mike running sound in the back and my dad seated in here, they didn't know who this person was. I knew exactly who this person was, and I was so pumped to get this album, okay? Now, as I took off the Christmas wrapping paper, my dad and my uncle did not need to know who the artist was. What they noticed immediately was that little sticker on the bottom right-hand corner. I didn't even get the plastic wrapping off the CD. I just got it. The person who gave it to me is in the room, literally watching me open it. They take the CD. They go immediately. I mean, this is, I'm not over-exaggerating. Take it, leave the party, go out to a tree, nailed it to a tree, sat down 30 feet away, took a pellet gun, and took turns shooting at it. I never even opened it. Destroyed. That's it. Destroyed. Okay, we'll come back to that later. 10% part, it's coming. Okay? Now, here's what we're going to look at today, because today we're going to look at Psalm chapter 22. All right, you feel free to follow along in the front, because this is what King David is doing. King David, of all the Psalms, he's, he's the lion's share uh, author of Psalms. And, and yes, King David had amazing moments. King David had the kind of moments that, that even just people who don't even believe in God know about. They've made their way even into culture, the David and Goliath type thing. And David, as is, is amazing as he was, okay, and amazing as he had these incredible moments... The, the ironic thing is the more power that David got, that he amassed, the more influence, the more complicated his life got, the more money he got. Um, his world, so often like what we see in our own world today, just kind of became a hot mess dumpster fire, okay? Uh, and, and actually, as a father, he really was not that awesome at all. 
And when you, you kind of follow his timeline, when you get past all of the amazing highlight reels, there's a lot of messed up stuff that's going on. In fact, many times when he's talking about the enemy, Lord, protect me from the enemy. The enemy has surrounded me. They're doing this to me. They're mocking me. The enemy, yes, there were enemies that they were dealing with. The enemy at times was also his own son. Mounting an attack to overthrow him. So, really complicated and painful. And he had a bunch of terrible things that happened in his family. And what I love about what we're going to look at in our, in our series today, we're just going to look at Psalms, and we're going to look at Psalm 22 specifically, is it's really instructive on a prayer life. Because so much of what David will do is it'll just be like, where are you? This is going wrong. This is messed up. What is happening here? I'm constantly having to react to a world. I'm outgunned, outmanned, outresourced. Lord, where are you? So this is what's happening the whole time, is he's caught in this world of, of acknowledging what the issues are. And the first thing that I want you to notice is as you're reading his words, I want you to catch how that can be instructive for you. So often, when you talk to a Christian, they'll think, well, I can't be angry, I can't fire up a, a prayer of desperation, or be upset, or have questions. And, and I hope even throughout this series, you'll start to maybe rethink your own prayer life. You can bring the hardcore, difficult, nitty-gritty, dark stuff to your God. You can do that. He's a loving, perfect Father. And in, in Psalm 22, that's how this starts out. The, the focus of Psalm 22 in the first half is simply what's going on in David's life. Okay? Here we go. Check it out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. You are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my, my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb... You have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd. And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But... Now, I love that but, and I cannot lie. All right, now here's, here's what I want you to know. <laughs> what I thought, about 15% got it. Outstanding, good, good. Now, here's what I want you to know. What happens? What happens rhetorically with the big but in your prayer life? What happens? You'll never forget this sermon. You have no idea what it's about. I'll ask you six months from now, what was the deep spiritual insight that you got out of that day? And you're going to go, Sir Mix-a-Lot. That's it. That's all you're going to know. 
What happens when people say but? It negates everything else, right? No new taxes. But what does that mean? New taxes. That's what it means, right? Do you take this woman to be your lawfully, right, your wife, to love and to hold and to cherish through sickness, right, and in health? I do. But what does that mean? What it means anytime you hear that, there'll never be war in the Middle East, but, right, this is going to be the new policy, but every time you hear a person say anything, from now on you can listen for it, whether it's a politician, a friend of yours, anyone in your world, just listen for the big but. And you know what that means? That means everything they just said to you, negate it. And now listen to what they're going to say after that, because what they're going to say after that is really what they plan on doing is really what they mean, is really their angle, is actually the outcome that they're wanting, see? And this is the beauty, this is the first thing I want you to catch on what happens in this text. He's throwing it all up, all of it. I'm hungry, I'm tired, people seem to have loved you, Lord, I'm worshiping you, I'm following you, but they seem to hate my guts. This seems to be going well in who you are, but look at what's happening to me. I'm honoring you, and nothing is coming my way. I'm trying to do it the way that you've instructed me to do it, and it's still blowing up in my face. I love you, and I honor you, but the people who don't seem to be living right and living well, while all wrath seems to be hurled upon me. Isolation, alone, exhaustion, getting my head kicked in. So the first part is this. You can do that. Do it. That's okay. He wants to know what is going on in your world. Is it your health? Do you feel in some way you're being ripped off in your world right now? Are you exhausted? Why are you tired? Are you bitter? Deep down, is there a thing going on in your world that you still to this day haven't let go of? And if you close your eyes for a second, it might as well have happened five minutes ago rather than 15 or 20 years ago. It's that real for you to this day. What's that thing? This is what's interesting about God and sometimes the way we think about the church and how the two can get so messed up. So often we come to the conclusion that we can't share all the real stuff with him because somehow he's going to be disappointed. The joke is he already knows Sometimes it's just a matter of, do you know? That's it. So when you throw all that up, see, and this is what David is doing. And he do, he's doing it so often in the Psalms because this world is on fire. And there came but. And he doesn't do the thing that I think sometimes we're told to do in American Christianity, which is now pull yourself up by your bootstraps, believe that it'll be better and it's just going to be better, Okay, with enough perseverance and mental concentration. Mallory and I were talking about this, like people who try to manifest it, okay? New age theology, that's not godly. That's mysticism and other things. Stay away from all of that, okay? So what do you do whenever it's, that is all, is, is where your world's at. What are you supposed to do? Well, you do what David did. Throw it all up, but, and then he switches. He switches the object of his prayer. And the object stops being about David and his problems, and it becomes more about God and his character. And that's the invitation for each and every one of us in your own prayer lives. Throw it all up, man. All of it. Every bit of it. Whatever's going on. Whatever's tearing you up. Whatever's messing you up. Give it all up to him, and then watch what happens. He goes, but you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. 
From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. To those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Now, you ready for the real mind twist? Like the four dimensional side of God's character? What's absolutely mind blowing is Psalm 22 is about Jesus. Think about what you've read in the Gospels. Think about the last 12 hours of Jesus' life. This is written over a thousand years before Jesus would even walk the earth. Same Holy Spirit, same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, working through all the prophets for all time. If we can go back to the beginning, I want to read it one more time, and here's all I want you to do now. I want you to read along with me, and I want you to think specifically as to what you may know about Jesus. And I'll emphasize some points to further accentuate the fact that this, what I'm saying is actually, it's about Jesus. And that's really, really important whenever we feel like our backs are up against the wall. Here it is. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you read that in the Gospels when he's hanging on the cross? There's something going on from the very beginning with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They are annoyed with Jesus to no end when he's hanging on the cross. And they even ask in Matthew, is he talking to Elijah? You know, Elijah hasn't come back. So they're always paranoid, like... When's Elijah going to come back into the game? It's not happenstance that Jesus is quoting and praying Psalm 22, quite possibly while he's hanging on the cross. And then I think all we get is little bits and pieces in the gospel account. But he starts out using the exact same words that Psalm 22 is about. And Psalm 22 would actually be a description. Read it this time now as a description of Jesus and his life. Speaking to his own father. Okay? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night. But I find no rest in the garden. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. But in you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. A.K.A. I'm your son. They worship you and they hate me. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. They trust in the Lord. They say, let the Lord rescue him. Why don't you come down from that cross? Try to imagine Jesus praying Psalm 22, and as he's praying Psalm 22, they are actually in real time doing Psalm 22. The thing that was written about Jesus a thousand years before the moment. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the room. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax, it is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd. I thirst, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. 
All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments, as the soldiers would do. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he is not despised or scorned. The suffering of the afflicted one, he has not hidden his face from him. He has not listened to his cry for help, but has listened to his cry for help. From you come the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. Who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn. He has done it. Or, it is finished. They beat Jesus. They stripped him of all of his clothes. And before they even humiliated him to that degree, they had a mock, fake, phony caricature of a trial in the middle of the night desperately drumming up charges that weren't even real. They assassinated every part of his character. They leveraged themselves, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, threatened Rome, pitting Rome against Rome, as the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and all of the Jewish authorities did not have the legal right to put anybody to death. That was with Rome and Rome alone. They were no longer allowed to do that. So they had to figure out a way to get Rome to execute their guy. And the only way that they could do that was to tell the people on the side, if you don't kill him, we will tell Caesar that you're no friend to Caesar. An incredible power play would happen. And none of Jesus' followers, with the exception of a few, would even be in earshot, isolated and alone. The early church hanging in the balance, anyone who followed him baffled and confused, dismayed and in hiding, certain that there's no way anything good could possibly come out of the present circumstances. It's impossible. Our guy is hanging on a cross. The plan is shattered. The dream ruined. It could never happen. How could God possibly bring something good out of this mess? And there's Jesus hanging on the cross, speaking the words that were penned more than a thousand years earlier, living out its fulfillment and its reality with only a few people at that point even in his camp, at least visibly there. You see, they beat him within an inch of his life, they hung him on a cross, and then they killed him. But he is alive. He has risen. Hallelujah. Your back may be up against the wall. You might feel like your situation will never get better. You may have worries and fears and anxieties that you can't even possibly imagine or fathom that God will somehow in some way work it out. It doesn't seem possible. It doesn't seem like he ever could, ever would. Does he hear your prayers or not? But here's the thing. No matter what the situation is, you worship a God who defeated sin, death, and Satan. Which means when you lift up your prayers in the moments of your darkest times in your entire life, 
You're lifting it up to a God who is the ultimate but in that sentence. Yes, they beat him. Yes, they killed him. But he lives. What does that mean? Him living conquers what even could have killed him. That's the power of Jesus. And that's what that means in your life and in mine. There's always hope in Jesus. There's not hope in you and there's not hope in me. We can't provide it to each other. You can't legislate it for one another. There aren't enough missiles and bombs and troops to ever make that work out. The peace on earth comes from Jesus and Jesus alone. The objects of our prayers in your marriage, in your family, in your country, in your society, in your own world has to be the one and the only who defeated sin, death, and Satan. Period. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.